Well, good morning. And welcome to First Baptist Fairdale this morning. It is good to be here. Good to have you with us. We're excited to worship the Lord this morning. As you are finding your seats, I want to encourage you to get your Bibles out and open to Psalm 23 for our call to worship. Psalm 23. And I want to remind you that immediately following the morning service today, we are going to have a VBS volunteer meeting. So VBS is about a month away, and we are going to need a lot of volunteers to make it happen. So if you're interested in serving uh, to make VBS happen, there's going to be a meeting right after the morning worship service downstairs in classroom one. Uh, you can also, if you're not able to make that meeting, you can find Matt McBroom or Liz McBroom and make sure you talk to them as well. Also, next Saturday, we are going to have a church fellowship with the Laymans. The Laymans are coming into town this week. And so on Saturday, we're going to have a time in the evening. Yeah, from 6 to 8 p.m. It'll be right here at the church. If you want to come, catch up with the Laymans, see what's been going on with them, talk to them, catch up with them. Saturday will be the time to do that. So Saturday evening right here at the church. And it also says to make sure you bring a lawn chair and also some lawn games if you want to do that. So, uh, again, lots of other announcements in the bulletin. Make sure you're keeping up with that so you know what's happening. we got the baby bottles in the back, uh, so take one of those as you leave today. Uh, but make sure you're looking at those announcements so you don't miss anything. But let's look now at our call to worship, Psalm 23. Perhaps you know this one. Maybe you know it by heart. Let's let this psalm lead us into worship. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. The cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, we thank you that this morning as we are gathered in for worship, we are reminded that you are our shepherd. God, there is nothing that we lack. You make us to lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters, and you restore our soul. But God, we also read that you lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. God, we pray that you would be doing that this morning. God, that you would be leading all of us in paths of righteousness. God, we are excited this morning that as we worship, it's going to be a, a, a unique Sunday for our church as we ordain some deacons and call them into serving here at our church. God, we are thankful that you have raised up these men. And we pray that this would be an encouraging Sunday morning for our church, that it would build us up, that it would point us to Jesus. And may we see in him one who serves and has served us even to the point of death on a cross. God, we thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand and sing with us? Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sound Sung by flaming tongues of pearl It's the burning mount of fire.
Amen. Would you remain standing and greet one another? Would you return to your seats as we continue in song?
Scripture reading this morning will be from Acts chapter 6, and we will read verses 1 through 7. Acts 6, verses 1 through 7. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company, and so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them, and so the word of God spread, and the, the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the examples that we have of how the church served you. We thank you, Lord, for, for those who are called out to serve you and to serve the church. We pray today, Lord, that you would be with us as we see two set apart to serve the church here at Fairdale. Lord, it is a wonderful thing to see a church growing, to see a church in need of those to serve. It is a wonderful thing to see those desiring to serve you and to serve the church. And Lord, today is, as we continue in our service, Lord, we pray that we would continue to honor you and praise you as we lay our hands on these two men today. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for their influence that they have had already on others. Lord, we praise you for Curtis and Cedric. They are a blessing to this church, Lord, and we pray that they would continue to serve you well in this place. Be with us, Lord, lead us and guide us. We love you above all things. It's in Christ's name we pray. sing. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such power?
pray for our offering. Father in heaven, thank you so much for all the many blessings of this life. Thank you that we get to be here, sing songs that praise your name and give glory and honor and worship to you. Lord, let us worship you now through this offering. Let us give cheerfully and abundantly from all the blessings that you've provided us. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Very, very rarely do we do a love offering here at church. A love offering is a second other offering um, where we ask you all, if you want to, to give some more. We're not doing this today because we need more money. We, we certainly don't. We're doing this today because we want to allow you or invite you to be involved in an enormous work. Marcus and Rachel Lehman are members of our church. They have four kids, 
and they are career missionaries. They are doing the best work you could ever do. They are translating the Bible into a language that does not have the Bible for a people that do not have the people to in a place that does not have the word of God. That is the very work they're doing. It is special. We are honored that they are a part of our church. We have sent them out and they are, they are trying, to, trying to get there. Uh, many people in our church are already on their support team and give to them regularly. Uh, any of you all are invited to get involved with that at any time, just let us know. But next weekend, Marcus and Rachel are gonna be here. He's gonna be preaching next Sunday. You'll get to spend time with them. And so we want to give them a financial gift next Sunday. And the church is gonna pitch in on this and we're gonna do, but we wanted to invite you in on it. I, I, we want you all to feel like you're involved with this international Bible translating work. If you've got a dollar in your pocket that you would like to give, then do it. We do not expect any of you all that you have to, do not feel obligated to. You can put cash in, you can write a check right now, write it to the church, but put layman's on it. Uh, you could go home today and give online if you wanted to do that. If you're watching online and you would love to give to this awesome work, you could give online. There's a, there's a, there's a tab that says Missions General. Missions General, so you could designate it that way. We will get all that together next week. And next Sunday morning in the service, uh, you will see us give an amount that will be larger than the amount that we're doing right now to this family. They are working really hard to get to where they're going in Africa. They are gonna make a detour stop in France so that the, the Marcus and Rachel and the kids can be in school and learn French. Uh, it's a big involved work. They are already working on translating it. And so we thought that it would be good spiritually for your heart, for you to be involved with this if you wanted to, okay? Never, ever feel obligated to give to something like this. I mean that. But if you want to be involved in supporting this family, then we ask you to now, okay? So these guys are gonna pass the plate one more time. You feel free to give to that. Uh, but before they do, I'm gonna go ahead now, I'm gonna go ahead now and have the pastoral prayer time for the layman's, all right? And so right now we're gonna pray, then we'll take the offering, and then after that, Pastor Josh Wamba is gonna come up and get us started with the, the preaching. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have taught us that your word is the authority. It is the message from you, your, your loving message to us to reveal to us yourself what you want us to know about you, the truth. And Father, this book has shaped our lives, it's shaped our homes, it's, it's shaped us and it shapes our church, God, as we seek to follow your word. God, we are thankful that we have it and we, we really can't imagine communities and homes and cultures and nations, how they even are working without the truth and guidance of your holy word that points us to our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And so Father, we are thankful for missions, we are thankful for those who have the gifting and skill set to do this work. And for that, God, we are thankful for Marcus and Rachel Lehman. God, we pray that you would bless them. We pray that next weekend would be such an encouragement to them as they get to spend time with us. And we pray, God, that you would empower them to go and do the work. God, that you would remove obstacles and help them get there, that books would be translated. As we've heard of Genesis and Exodus and now the book of Job, God, that the, that the work would go on, that it would advance, God. We pray that soon the, the, the Chichipu people, God, would have this book in their hands, would have this word being spoken to their hearts and minds, that they would hear of you sending your Savior, your Son, to die on the cross for them, that you would forgive all their sins upon believing. Oh, Father, we pray that you would get this message and you would use Marcus and Rachel to that end. Father, I pray that anytime we're taking up money, you would guard our church from ever thinking that that's all that we're about. God, help us to be wise, good stewards. God, help us to be gracious, giving, and supportive, and, and that it would be kind of the, the feel, the culture here that, that, that we're not pressured, but that it is a discipleship issue that we are glad to give. Father, I pray right now that you would bless this offering for Marcus and Rachel Lehman. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
you would open up with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. As you've already noticed from the bulletin and from the fact that we have two sermons today, that this is a little bit different kind of service than we normally have on a Sunday morning. And, uh, and that's good. Normally our focus is on, uh, is on God and on the Lord Jesus. Focus is on what he's done and what he's doing uh, among us. And that's the case today as well. Uh, today our focus, though, is on Cedric Jones and Curtis McBroom um, and what God's doing in their lives as well. And especially what God's doing in our church through them and through their lives. Cedric is being ordained uh, to serve God's church as a deacon this morning. And it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, Curtis has, uh, has already been ordained in, in the past, but he's also being recognized today as someone that the Lord has called to serve his church as a deacon. And that's a big deal, too. They're taking on some, some new responsibilities, um, at least officially they are. Uh, they're going to be responsible to us as a church in some new ways. Uh, they're going to have certain obligations toward us as a church that they did not have yesterday or before. But Josh will talk about those more here in a, in a few minutes. We as a church are also taking on some new responsibilities, uh, some different responsibilities than we have had before toward Cedric and uh, Curtis. We're going to be responsible to them in some new ways. We're going to have certain obligations toward them that we didn't have before. And specifically what I want to say today uh, is that we need to trust them, we need to rely on them, and we need to support them. We need to trust them, rely on them, and uh, support them. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, say this. It says, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to, to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. We as a church are called and obligated to trust Cedric and Curtis. We read in, in, in the beginning there that, that there are certain qualifications that a deacon must meet. And we as a church have recognized that Cedric and Curtis meet those qualifications. We're responsible to give them a freedom to serve the way that God has, has called them. We're ordaining them, we're marking them off as, as men that God has called to serve his church, and we should trust them to do so. This means that, that, that we should give them the benefit of the doubt if that service looks a little different maybe than the way that, that we would have done it. We need to trust that they are who we are saying they are. We should see their decisions and their actions in the best possible light and give them the benefit of, of the doubt. We should trust them. Here this morning, we're not making them deacons. We're recognizing that God has called them to be deacons. And we're setting them apart for that, for that purpose. And so if we believe that God is calling them to be deacons, we believe that God has equipped them to serve our church as, a, as deacons, then we should trust them to do so. A second thing that, that we're obligated for toward, toward Cedric and Curtis is we're obligated to rely on them. We should rely on them um, as God's church. Cedric has been around our church now for, for several years. He, he started coming around soon after he graduated high school. And we've seen him grow in the Lord. We've seen him take on adult responsibilities. We've seen him be a good son and brother to his family over, over the last year. We've seen him begin to be a faithful husband to Yosetis. And Curtis has been a member of our church now for several years as well. We've come to know him as a mature follower of 
Jesus as a faithful, loving, serving husband to his wife, Becky. We've seen him be a great mom or a great son to his mom. We're also able to see the fruit of his life in his dedicated and faithful children. Paul tells the church in Ephesians 1, uh, or I'm sorry, in, in Ephesus here in 1 Timothy, uh, to, to first test potential deacons and then let them serve only if they prove themselves. And Cedric and Curtis have proven themselves before us. We've watched them both now for several years, and we're convinced, again, based on these qualifications, that God has made them deacons, and we're recognizing it here today. Cedric and, and Curtis have both proven themselves reliable, and now we should rely on them. We should let them serve. We should look to them to serve. We should expect them to serve. We should let them serve us individually and collectively as a church. I remember a, a friend of mine one time, I was in a situation where I needed some help with something, and a friend of mine, I was kind of resisting that help, and, and a good friend of mine said that, he said, you're humble enough to serve other people, but you're not humble enough to let other people serve you. We as a church, we as individuals should be humble enough to let Cedric and let Curtis serve us. This is what the Lord has called them to. This is what the Lord has equipped them for. We should humble ourselves and let them serve us, rely on them to do what God has called them to do. We should let them know whenever we need something. We should call them when they're deacon of the week. I don't know if you know to, Notice, but on, on the bulletin, there's a deacon of the week each week. And so that means that each week, if you have an issue, if you have a problem, if you need something that you need help with, then you're encouraged to call that deacon. Um, you can call any of the deacons or, or pastors or church office or whatever, but you're encouraged to call that deacon um, if he's the deacon of the week. We should, we should do that. We should call him at other times, too, and we should make them aware of needs that we know of, make them aware of our own needs and of needs of other people in the church and needs of other people in the community that our deacons might be able to, to serve. We should trust them. We should rely on them. And finally, we should support them. We should support them. Paul talks here about deacons who serve well in verse 13. Pastor Josh is going to talk about that a little bit more here in a few minutes, about what it means to serve well and, and, and preach directly to, uh, to Cedric and Curtis. But I'm preaching to us, to the church right now. And if it's possible for deacons to serve well, that also means it's possible for deacons to not serve well. And we should support Cedric and, and Curtis and help them serve well as deacons, help them be good deacons to us, to our church. We should try to make it easy for them to serve us well. We should try to be people individually that are easy to serve. We should try to be a church collectively that's easy to serve. We should regularly pray for Cedric and for Curtis We should pray for our other deacons. We should pray for their families. And we should serve with Cedric and we should serve with Curtis and, and, and with our other deacons. God has called Cedric and Curtis and others to the office of, of deacon or servant. This doesn't mean that we're not to serve also though. This means that, uh, that we should follow them in service as well. We should serve one another and those outside of our church and we should follow the good example of our of our deacons and now of Cedric and of Curtis in doing that. That we might be good servants of, of the Lord and of our church. Here in a few minutes, we're going to set Cedric and, and Curtis apart. We're going to mark them off as people that the Lord has called, people that our church has confirmed to be servants, to be deacons. We're starting a new relationship here today. From now on, Curtis and Cedric like I said, are going to relate a little bit differently to us, and we're going to relate, relate a little bit differently to them. These new responsibilities, new obligations that they have toward us and that we have toward them. We should trust them to be the kind of person that we say God is calling them to be and that we're confirming today. We should rely on them to serve the way that God has called them to serve. And we should support them as they serve to the best of their ability through the power of the Holy Spirit working in them and in our church. May the Lord grant that we do that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for, for gifting Cedric and Curtis to us, to our church. 
And God, I pray that you would help them to be good deacons to us. And God, I pray that you would help us to be good uh, church members and a good church to them. God, I pray that you would help us to, to trust them, to trust that you've called them to serve and to trust them in the way that they're follow, following their calling. Father, I pray that you would help us to rely on them. Oftentimes it's hard to rely on others and seek others for help. And God, I pray that you would help us to do that. Humble us to the point that we are, are eager to reach out when we need help and eager to point out other, uh, other opportunities that, that, that need help that we know of. And God, I pray that you would help us to be supportive of them. God, I pray you'd make us people that are easy to serve, easy to be served. And God, I pray that you would often bring Cedric and Curtis and their families and the other deacons and their families to our minds that we might regularly pray for them. We might follow them as they're leading us in service. And Father, we might look to their example to know what it means to be a good, a good servant to you. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus who served us by giving his life. And God, we pray that Cedric and Curtis would serve us as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for that, Josh. <clears throat> a little bit awkward for two men to sit up here on the front row and and us put so much attention toward them. I want us to stay right there in that same passage in 1 Timothy chapter three. And while we're calling that a charge to the church and we're thankful for Pastor Wamble helping us think through how we trust, rely, and support, now I want you all to hear us speak a message toward the deacons in hope that the overflow of that toward them would impact all of us. First Timothy chapter three, right here, verses eight through 13, the passage that we have already read, it is the passage on the qualifications for deacons. There's not another. The passage right before that is the qualifications for pastors, elders, overseers, and you do have that in Titus one. The, the pastor qualifications is in two places, but not the deacon, it's only here. And so really what we know about deacons are who can be a deacon? That's really the big conversation. And that's what this passage seeks to address. Who can be a deacon? But the question that we're always asking that we really don't have an answer to is what do deacons do? Now that's a good question. What do deacons do? And the Bible doesn't say anything about it. The Bible doesn't say what deacons do. It just says here what you have in verse 13, those who serve well. We have mention of deacons several times, but it never tells us what they do. And that's, that's, that's good, because it's supposed to be wide open like that. The word deacon means those that serve. It means servants. It simply means those that serve. And so it is broad, it is wide open. What do they do? And so I want to uh, give a summary of what deacons do. They are to be helpful. Does everybody hear that today? They are to be helpful. Whatever we need help with, organizationally as a church, like a Sunday service, personally in the church body's lives, like you need something at home, if you need a visit, whatever the church needs help with, we have designated people in leadership positions called the deacon who want to help. They have been recognized as those who are helpful. When it says those who serve well, and you think, well, doing what? Here's the answer biblically. Being helpful anywhere with anything. How the body needs help, what could they do? They need to pick up trash in the church parking lot when they pull in. They need to provide a meal for somebody. Do they need to do an in-home visit or a hospital visit? Help however. Does somebody need to talk this afternoon about how to accept Christ? Help however. They also help the pastors by carrying the burden. They also help the pastors by carrying some of their load. But the answer is to be helpful with no hesitation. We know these two men and their wives to be extremely helpful. 
you all know these two men to be extremely helpful. They have helped us already so very much. They have helped you all already so very much. And so, Josh Womble is exactly right. This is not us making you guys deacons. This is God has called you all to be deacons, and we have recognized that. And we thank God for it. If what the deacon does is be helpful, then let's think through that a little bit further. There is a passage in Acts chapter 6, which we read, Matt McBroom read earlier. There is a passage in Acts chapter 6 that seems to be about deacons. Now, we don't have this called deacons in the church yet, but it seems to be what this is. And I want to read it to you again. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because, listen, their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So here's an issue, a problem, an area where help is needed. Widows are not receiving the food that's supposed to be distributed to them. Okay, everybody see that? Keep going. And the 12, that's the apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They end up doing that, they set them aside, they choose these people, it says in verse six, they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly, all right? So in this passage, we see two problems. Two problems come up. The distribution of the food is struggling. There's too much need. There are too many widows in need. There, it's taking too much effort. And the apostles who are to give their energy toward the preaching of the word are being pulled into doing this too much, and it's just become a mess. It's a problem that we see all the time. Perhaps you've heard somebody say before, well, we've got one person trying to do all the work, and it's frustrating. Perhaps you've heard in organizations before, whether it be churches or schools or ball teams or offices, 10% of the people doing 90% of the work or 20% of the people doing 80% of the work, and it is frustrating. That's what they have going on here in Acts chapter 6. So the first problem that you see there is this distribution of food, but there's also another problem. The apostles come back and they say, hey, it's not good for us to stop preaching. So there's two problems. There is the distribution of food and there also is the witness of the gospel. There is their gospel witness, the preaching the word, going out and evangelizing and seeking to convert people to Jesus. There were two problems. And so they came up with this solution that said, hey, if we've got some people that will gladly do this responsibility then we've got some people who can also gladly do this responsibility. And the leadership team that day more than doubled. It nearly tripled that day, didn't it? They went from, uh, tw they went from what they had and they added seven more. Sorry about that double, triple, my numbers are off. I was thinking of the four pastor model like we have here, all right? So they went from 12 and they added seven more and it grew and it got that much stronger, right? But the idea behind it was, if these people will be devoted to this, then this area will get stronger. Church, are you aware that that's how organizations grow and are healthy and strive? Curtis and Cedric, are you aware that when you serve well, like this says, it allows everybody else in this organization to serve well? Do you get that? God calling you to do your job is not something else for you to put on your resume. This is not some rank in the ladder that you're climbing. It is you understanding God has a purpose in his church. There is a mission behind us being here. There is a mission behind you being involved with this. Notice in Acts chapter six that they were trying to advance the kingdom and spread the gospel. There are people in the world that need to know Jesus. There are people in our church. We have now tons and tons of young people in our church and children and babies and nursery and kids and youth and students and teenagers, more and more and more. 
And it is our responsibility not to run them crazy. It is our responsibility not to exasperate them. It is not our responsibility to overwhelm them and frustrate them with laws and burdens and rules. It's not. It is our responsibility to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It is our responsibility to put before them the beautiful truth of God and his word, to preach Christ to them, to show them of the one who died on the cross for them. It is our responsibility to make disciples out of these young people. And as the numbers are growing more and more and more, the the responsibility becomes just more obvious. And we need to be thinking, these people need to do this, so these people can 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 do this. What are our jobs and responsibilities in the kingdom of God, in the church? And two that we recognize here today are people called by God to be deacons, to go and be helpful wherever they can for the sake of us advancing the mission. Practically, the church should get from you all, and this is what Josh Womble spoke to, the church should get from you all that Curtis and Cedric are here to help however they can. Practically, the four pastors in our church should be thinking, these guys, along with the rest of our deacons, and this now gets us up to 11 deacons. We have 11 deacons now in the church, now that we have these two. Practically, the four pastors should be thinking, there are, there are ways that we are set free to be able to do more that we do because these guys want to be helpful. I cannot tell you how many times that I have been here at church, we have been here at church, and somebody has gone and sought out these guys or sought out some deacons and say, hey, I need some help, can you do it? Just the other night, I was in classroom one with a meeting with some people, some counseling, a meeting or whatever, and we noticed that the trash room in classroom one, you've never noticed this, the trash room in classroom one is always like piled up high because that's the closest trash, trash can to the door, right? And so I'm over there trying to get it together, and you know how that is. Once people pile it up too high, it's the thing that drives you crazy at home. The kids, instead of taking out the trash, they just keep it piling up, right? And so you try to pull the bag out, and it falls everywhere. That's happening in classroom one just the other night. And I'm trying to get it all together while keep this meeting going. And just like that, just like that, I'm doing that. A deacon comes right up, doesn't even say a word, and says, here, man, let me do that for you. You keep leading the meeting. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that helpful? Isn't that cool that one person's like, hey, you're, you're trying to meet with some people. Keep doing that. I'll take out the trash. Let's keep this thing going. This is the idea behind teamwork. This is the idea behind what's my responsibility. This is the idea behind being helpful. Curtis and Cedric, when we hear the idea, be helpful, serve well, There's a tendency for our minds to just go to basic, practical things. And I like that, 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 that's kind of where I'm at and I think about that a lot. Trash needs to be taken out, okay? But I wanna remind Curtis and Cedric here this morning that while we are, yes, all about helping people physically, practically, basically, we do need an army of people to unload the Dare to Care food truck once a month. We need people to do those things. But Cedric and Curtis, let me remind you here today, more importantly, we are here to help people find God. And we need help to truly do that. When we use the word help in spiritual life, spiritually helping This is not a concept that we've made up. A quick glance at your whole Bible or a Google search will show you that this expression is used all the time in the Bible. God is my helper. God is my helper. I love that expression. God is helpful. And that's not some prosperity message. God is helpful to us. God is my helper. Hebrews 13 says, God is my helper. Psalm 54, 4 says, God is my helper. The Bible says it over and over again that God is my helper. And so Cedric and Curtis, I want y'all to understand. Let me walk through four quick points. Number one, you guys need help. At the very core of what it means to be a deacon, and we saw this in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says you must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. You remember that? 
This does not mean that anybody can be a deacon. This does not mean that people are just good at helping should be deacons. This does not mean that those that are hard working with a work ethic should be deacons. This means that people who understand helping for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ should be deacons. People who understand being helpful for the advancement of the kingdom should be deacons. People who understand being helpful because God has helped them so much should be deacons. It says that there. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must know that you guys need help. Curtis and Cedric, apart from the saving work of Jesus in your lives, you would not be who you are. And if you can be the men that you are without Jesus' power inside of you, then we've mistaken this here today, and you should not be deacons. We are not looking for the good men in South Louisville to be leaders in our church. We're looking for the serving, helpful men that love the Lord Jesus Christ to be leaders in our church. Because our mission is not to take out the trash. Our mission is to make every one of you faithful followers of Christ. Do you realize that you need help, and we know that you do? In realizing, number one, that you know that you need help, number two, we recognize that you've been helped. Jesus has helped you. You need help and you've been helped. Jesus has helped you. He's forgiven you of your sins. He has raised, he has ri- raised you up out of uh, sin and death and given you life. He's given you a church family. He's given you brothers and sisters in Christ. You have been helped. Number three, on the idea of being helpful, we need help. Contrary to pride and arrogance and uh, putting on a, a, a front image, we need help. Every one of us needs help to hold on to Christ and to follow him. We need encouragement, we need support, we need accountability, right? We need people to look us in the eye. We need people to hug us around the neck. We need people at times to watch our kids. We need people at times to help us out with a meal. We need people to pray for us, teach the scriptures to us. We need people to disciple us. We are a needy people. We need thee, oh, we need thee. Every hour, Lord Jesus, we need thee. And Curtis and Cedric, you guys are to recognize that you are a part of a church of needy people, right? This is a big responsibility. We need good deacons in our lives. So number four, help us receive help. Be involved in meetings that think about what the church needs. Be in relationship with your pastors to think about, hey, how can I be helpful? Where's our church going? What direction is our church going? What are the needs around here? What does it look like to be helpful? We have five kids in our family, and a lot of times we'll pull home in the van, all seven of us, and we're about to unload, and it's a long day, and you're tired, and everybody's about to go inside and and scatter and go do all the things that they do. And a lot of times, before we get out of the car, I'll say, y'all, wait a second. I know we're all about to go in and do seven different things. Before you go do whatever you wanna do, I want you to look around and figure out how to be helpful. I don't know what we're gonna do when we go inside, and I don't know what needs to be done, but when you get inside, you figure out what would be helpful. Does mom need help? Does Liliana need help? Does the trash need to be taken out? Does your bed need to be made? What what needs to happen? I don't know what needs to happen, but look around and figure out that and be helpful. That's what deacons do. Now, we've got deacons that meet together to figure that out. We've got pastors that work with them to figure that out. We've got a church that makes their needs known so that we can help. But we need to recognize, Curtis and Cedric, that you've been helped. You need help. You've been helped. We need help. Now, help us receive help. The beautiful thing about the body of Christ is that Jesus teaches he's the head of the body and the people are the body. And because of that, Jesus being the head of it, we're all united. We're in this together. We love each other. We serve each other. And that means we're able to identify needs. We're able to recognize areas that need some help. Just in the last couple weeks, an area in our church was brought to mind. We had some small things brought to our attention that needed to be addressed. We had a meeting. We talked to the deacons. We said, we need somebody to do this. Who could do it? We had a deacon in that meeting saying, I can do that. We said, well, that means you're gonna have to start getting here earlier and being there and you have to miss out on this, but can you do that? He said, I can do that, no problem. Now, that helpful, needed area has been addressed, it's been resolved, and it's been fixed because there are people who say, I want to help. 
Curtis and Cedric, to serve well, you must be helpful. And we want this church of all of these people to know they can count on you to help them. Thankfully, our church is committed to the mission of preaching the word and proclaiming Jesus Christ to people so that they can find life in Christ. No doubt about it. We will do that better, more successfully, more faithfully when you two men serve well. When I graduated high school and went off to college, I had the awesome opportunity and privilege to play basketball in college. And after I got a few years in, I remember making a phone call back to my high school basketball coach. He had not heard from me in years. And I remember making a phone call back to my high school basketball coach and saying, Coach Flo, I just wanna thank you. Here I am in college and I am reminded of so many things that you helped me with. Eye contact, work ethic, discipline, being on time, being able to sweat, fall down, get back up. We could go on and on. Thank you for helping me. Several years later, about three years later, I had moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and I was going to Southern Seminary. And I had graduated from North Greenville College. My bachelor's degree is in Bible, and now my master's degree is in Bible too, in, in seminary. And I remember being one or two years into seminary, and I called up Dr. Johnson from North Greenville, who was my leader there in my degree there. And I called up Dr. Johnson, it had been a couple of years, I said, Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for all the help you gave me in college. In seminary, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels sometimes because the books they're asking me to read, you already asked me to read. The things that we're studying now, you already taught us. The issues we've already working, that we're working through now, you already helped me work through. Thank you for being so helpful. Hey, with Christians and churches, as people are growing in their faith, they recognize right away, I can't do this on my own. It takes other people in my life. That's what church is. Here today, church, you're being introduced to two more deacons. Curtis and Cedric, and may the result of it be more and more of you all in our church thinking God is working in my life. I am growing in my faith in Christ. I am maturing in my faith. I am loving Jesus more because of the people in my church that are helping me. And may that start today with Curtis and Cedric. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for having helped us so much. Father, thank you for being our helper and for giving us of our sins and giving us life in Christ. And thank you, God, that you placed us in a church and we now recognize that you create people to be more helpful. Father, we thank you for Curtis and Cedric. And we pray, God, that you would use them to be helpful in our church, that it would advance the mission that more people would know you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, in the Bible, in that passage we read in Acts 6, and other passage in the book of Acts, here's what it said they did. They set them apart and gathered around them, laid hands on them, and prayed. And so we're gonna do that very thing today. I wanna ask Curtis, if you come sit right here, and Cedric, if you come sit right here. And I wanna ask the pastor, elders in our church, and the deacons in our church to come forward and gather around both of these guys. Everybody gather around, put a hand on these guys. We're gonna take about two minutes of a, of a dead silence for all of you all to be able to pray. And then I'm gonna ask our other two pastors, Matt and Jay, well, Josh Wombo's got the mic right here. And Jake is gonna pray for Cedric and Matt is gonna pray for Curtis after a moment of silence where you all have prayed for them too. I wanna ask you if you would to bow your heads there, pray for Curtis, that he'd be a good deacon in our church, pray for Cedric, that he'd be a good deacon in our church. After this moment of silence of us praying, Jake's gonna pray and then Matt's gonna pray and then we'll all go back to our seats.
I want to pray specifically for Cedric this morning as we are setting him apart as a deacon in our church. God, I want to pray for his spiritual life. God, I pray that he would be a man who is seeking after you in private <clears throat> as much as he is here in public. I pray that he would be a man of godly integrity in each and every situation, in each and every um, aspect of his life, not just in the one that we see publicly, but that he would be a man who is seeking after you, trusting in you, taking his worries and cares and concerns to you. God, I pray that Cedric would be a man who serves with, with a, a, an upright heart, that he wouldn't serve just because he feels that he has to with the title of deacon, but that he would serve because he has a desire to, but that he would serve because he knows that he has been served by your son. God, I pray that Cedric would be a great husband to Yosetis. I pray that he would continue to make sure he prioritizes his family, that he is serving her, and perhaps as their family grows in the future, uh, serving his, his children. And God, we pray that you'd help Cedric to be a man who understands that he has responsibility to his family, that he is to care for them, to provide for them, to protect them. And God, I pray he would take that serious. And I pray that we as a church would help him in those areas, that he would know that we love and support him. And so that as he serves our church, he would know that our church loves and supports him. God, I pray that Cedric being a deacon in our church would be a blessing to us. And I pray that we as a church would be a blessing to him. God, we thank you for this special day. We thank you for Cedric. We thank you for Yosetis. We thank you for the work that you are doing in their lives, in Cedric's life. And God, we thank you that all of it points to Jesus as the one who's done a work in our lives. Mm. Jesus is the one who set us apart. Jesus is the one who saved us. Jesus is the one who's given us a heart that desires to serve. And may it, may Cedric's serving as a deacon glorify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for these two men. We thank you that you have called them and set them apart, Lord, to serve your church. Thank you, Lord, for the heritage of faith. Faith that was held by my grandfather, CJ, my grandfather, John. It resides in my dad, Curtis, here. And he's passed on to my brother and I. We thank you, Lord, for being faithful. Lord, and as Curtis serves here, I pray, Lord, that you would give him wisdom, give him strength, give him discernment, give him courage, give him the words to speak, give him the time to be silent, give him the opportunity to share the love of Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have called him to serve. Thank you that I call him father, that I call him brother, and that we serve you together. Thank you for his wife, Becky. We pray that you be with her. Help her to be supportive and loving and understanding of his service and sacrifice to the church. We thank you for their witness Lord, and we know that all of these things are only possible because of your great love. We pray your grace and mercy upon them. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
since today was uh, a deacon day, we thought it fitting right now to take one more step. We have a deacon in our church who has been exemplary for a long time. Mr. Doug Williams has been a part of our church for many, many years. And he has served in this very role as a deacon of First Baptist Fairdale for over 27 years. I moved here in July of 2003. Before I even joined the church, they invited me to come to a 9 a.m. Sunday morning prayer meeting. We still meet every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And any of you all are welcome to come just to pray before Sunday school gets going. We sat right here on these first few pews, and on that day, Mr. Doug Williams was right there. Every single Sunday since then, including this morning, May the 16th of 2021, Mr. Doug Williams has been right there. I cannot tell you all how helpful he has been to us leaders. We have called him, honestly, thousands of times. We ask him to do so much. We have called on him to help in our personal lives, and we have called on him to help here at church. Mr. Doug is the perfect example of a biblical deacon. He loves the Lord Jesus Christ, he believes the Bible, and he serves well. He loves his wife, and he serves her well. And they have been, for many, many years, a blessing to this church. I want to ask Mr. Doug and Miss Betty if they would please come up here. We are now officially moving Mr. Doug Williams into the position of Deacon Emeritus, which means he will forever be a deacon here, a position of honor, whether he wants to be one or not, that's up to him. <laughs> uh, but Mr. Doug, we recognize you as being a man of God and a true blessing to me personally and to our church. Here's a plaque that says Deacon Emeritus, Mr. Doug Williams. We'll put a picture of, of Doug and Betty in that. We'll put it on the wall down here. And here's a certificate that says the same thing that you'll be able to take home. Church, please join me in honoring Doug and Betty Williams. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Doug. Thank you. Here you go, take these and you can go back to your seat. I'm going to ask Andrew and the band if they would come up now. They need to get a picture, okay. Certainly a different type of service, but still one where Christ is Lord. And the Bible is true, and the church is made up of people that believe him. As we sing our final song today, let's respond. May God move in your heart for you to be helpful. May God move in your heart for you to be a part of the work that's going on here. If you need to come forward and talk to one of us about anything, you can. Let's sing a final song of response.
Cedric and Curtis, if you guys want to come up at the end of the service when we're finished here, if you guys want to come around and uh, congratulate them or uh, pray with them or whatever you want to do, you're welcome to do that. Um, we're having service tonight. Matt McBroom, Pastor Matt McBroom will be preaching to us, uh, continuing our Ten Commandments series. Everyone's invited to that. And then immediately after the service, um, downstairs in the basement, there is a uh, meeting for anyone interested in serving with Vacation Bible School. Okay? Uh, to end our service, I'm going to read... Uh, Jesus' words about being uh, a servant in Matthew chapter 20. It says, But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercised authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever will be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. <laughs> 